We'll start with the label diagram of the male reproductive system and we'll talk about some of the functions of each of the parts we have labeled here. We'll begin with the testicles which are the primary site of sperm production in the male reproductive system. Each testicle is going to contain two to three seminiferous tubules and these are the tubules in which we'll see sperm being produced. Within these tubules, the testicles can make up to 300 million sperm per day with alternative options for storage further through the male reproductive system. Importantly, sperm production and storage requires a temperature that's two to three degrees lower than normal body temperature. As a result, the scrotum utilizes the cremaster muscle to control the scrotum height, allowing it to fall or come closer to the body in order to regulate temperature. After creation of the seminiferous tubules of the testicles, the sperm will move towards the epididymis, which will act as the site of sperm maturation, as well as the site of storage. Usually, sperm will take around 14 days to mature. After those 14 days, the sperm may be stored in the epididymis for up to two to three months. As we move up our diagram, we'll begin talking about the urethra. The urethra can be broken into three separate sections, the first being the prostatic urethra, or the portion of the urethra that's actually going to travel through the prostate. The second portion of the urethra is the intermediate urethra, and this is going to run through the peritoneal area. And finally, we have the spongy urethra, which is the portion of the urethra that's actually going to run through the penis itself. The next piece of anatomy we will talk about is the prostate gland, and the prostate gland secretes an acidic fluid as well as some nutrients in order to nourish the sperm. Finally, the seminal vesicle also plays a supporting role in the movement and nourishment of sperm. The seminal vesicle secretes a neutralizing alkaline fluid that helps sperm stay alive in the acidic environment of the male and female reproductive systems. In order to better understand how sperm production works, we'll blow up a section of our testicle here so that we can take a better look at where sperm is being produced and how it flows through the testicles themselves. So the first thing we're going to label here is our seminiferous tubule and in the seminiferous tubule we're going to have two different types of cell that are going to help support or actually act in sperm production. The first of these cells are the spermatogenic cells and these are the cells that are actually going to participate in sperm production. Second, we have our sustentacular cells or our supporting cells. The function of these cells are to support the spermatogenic cells in the actual production of sperm. After the completion of sperm production, the seminiferous tubules will also produce a fluid that will help push sperm towards the ret testi. From the ret testi, sperm will move into the epididymis. Two anatomical structures can be found within the epididymis, the first being the efferent ductus, and the second being the epididymis caput. Finally, upon exiting the epididymis, sperm will move towards the vas deferens and eventual exit from the body. Prior to speaking to the actual physiology behind sperm production, we should talk about the key anatomical players. The first is the hypothalamus, which is going to serve as the neuroendocrine link between the brain and the anterior pituitary gland. For sperm production, we're concerned about the anterior pituitary gland, which is going to secrete luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone in order to promote sm sperm production. Next, we're going to talk about a supportive cell. This is a Leydig cell. The Leydig cell plays an important role in, in both male physiology and sperm production as it's going to be the cell that releases testosterone. Next, we're going to talk about our serotoli cells, often known as nurse cells. These serotoli cells are actually going to form tight junctions that control the amount of nutrients that can make their way to the spermatogenic or the spermatogonia cells. As a result, the serotoli cells are going to be the ones that nurture the sperm or the spermatogonia cells through the provision of nutrients in order for development to occur. These serotoli cells also release what are called androgen binding proteins, which are going to allow us to see an increase in the amount of testosterone that lives around the serotoli cells. Finally, it's from these spermatogenic or spermatogonia cells which we actually see sperm production occur. This is where the process of meiosis will take place, eventually forming the sperm that will develop and move on from the seminiferous tubules. First, in order to talk about the physiology of sperm production, we'll talk about the Leydig cell. Like any of our gametes, we start off the process by the release of GnRH from the hypothalamus, which is now going to stimulate the release of luteinizing hormone. We're going to talk about luteinizing hormone first, as this is the hormone that's actually going to stimulate the release of testosterone from the Leydig cell. Therefore, luteinizing hormone is released from the anterior pituitary, stimulating the Leydig cell, and as that Leydig cell is stimulated, we start to see testosterone released. 
This is going to have a number of effects. First, testosterone will be turned into dihydrotestosterone in the prostate, and this is where we're going to see the development, or this is how we're going to see the development of a number of secondary sex characteristics. The second thing that occurs is testosterone is going to help support the development of spermatogenic cells or spermatogonia cells. The release of testosterone helps nurture these cells and stimulate meiosis for actual gamete production. The next hormone we're going to talk about is follicle stimulating hormone and the role that follicle stimulating hormone plays in interacting with the serotoli cells. Again, GnRH is going to stimulate the release of follicle stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary gland. After the FSH is released, it's going to travel through the bloodstream to the serotoli cells where it's going to enact its function. In this case, as the serotoli cells again are a supportive cell and not necessarily the primary cell involved in spermatogenesis, what we're going to see is the release of androgen binding proteins. So as FSH binds those serotoli cells, androgen binding proteins are going to increase. And, and what these androgen binding proteins do is they increase the amount of testosterone surrounding the spermatogonia cells. So as we see an increase in androgen binding proteins, they bind to testosterone and they increase the local concentration of testosterone surrounding the serotoli cells and the spermatogonia cells. This increase in concentration is going to help promote sperm production and as a result we'll see increased sperm being created. Although a large amount of sperm are produced before inhibition happens, there is an inhibitory mechanism in place to prevent too much sperm from being produced. We generally see about 8 billion sperm produced in one single sperm production cycle. As sperm levels begin to peak, we start to see the release of inhibin, which is going to decrease the release of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Inhibition also occurs from testosterone. As testosterone levels rise, a negative feedback loop occurs in which the release of GnRH from the hypothalamus is inhibited. If we take a look at this process from the negative feedback perspective, we can see that this negative feedback is going to lead to cyclical production in testosterone and sperm. As negative feedback serves its purpose or as testosterone levels rise and inhibit the release of GnRH and luteinizing hormone, that's naturally going to lead to a decrease in testosterone concentration within the body. Concentration of testosterone begins to fall, we're going to see negative feedback stop occurring and GnRH will be released again. With the release of this GnRH, we're going to see it travel through the hypophysal portal system to the anterior pituitary gland where we will have release of luteinizing hormone. That luteinizing hormone will travel to our Leydig cells where it will activate the Leydig cells to produce more testosterone. As we mentioned previously, this testosterone is going to have a couple of functions. Testosterone is going to be turned into dihydrotestosterone in the prostate. We will see an increase in secondary sex characteristics. And that testosterone also serves an important role in stimulating the serotoli cells to support spermatogenesis or to promote sperm production. So that testosterone is going to be supportive to the serotoli cells while also promoting the differentiation of spermatogenic cells into sperm. Negative feedback is also occurring in terms of sperm. As we start to see completion of the sperm cycle, levels have risen to the point where inhibition is being released and it's decreasing the amount of follicle stimulating that hormone that's being released. However, as we start to see negative feedback performing its function and sperm production starts to decrease, we'll let back on that negative feedback, which is going to lead to an increased release in follicle stimulating hormone. As we mentioned, follicle stimulating hormone is going to travel to the serotoli cells and it's going to activate the serotoli cells to release our androgen binding proteins. Those androgen binding proteins are going to bind to that testosterone that's been released by Leydig cells and increase the local concentration of testosterone around the serotoli cells. This is going to allow for that testosterone to work primarily on those spermatogenic cells or those differentiating sperms in order to have further differentiation and increase sperm production.